Hi everyone, welcome to episode two of Ch Carousel Chats. Today we're going to be learning about Lost Parks and our presenters are Jennifer Sofko and Rose Hirsch. Carousel Chats is a free virtual program series um, by the Herschel Carousel Factory Museum Education Department and sponsored by the Building Capacity Grant from the Museum Association of New York. Unfortunately, Lori DeSalvo could not join us today, um, but we do hope to have her on at a later time. And Jen, I'm gonna pass it over to you now. Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer Sopko and I'm a Pittsburgh based writer and historian currently researching lost amusement parks across Western Pennsylvania. This is a pretty unique re region in terms of amusement park development between its topography and the transportation and industry that evolved here. Western PA is by no means flat as we've got the Appalachian mountain range and we have an extensive waterway network between the Ohio River Valley with the three rivers that converge in Pittsburgh in the Southwest and Lake Erie in the Northwest. So many parks were built along rivers and creeks on plateaus and in natural valleys. The industry that grew around cities like Pittsburgh, Johnstown, Newcastle and Erie from steel and aluminum to coal and coke to glass and manufacturing increased the population settling in this area and created a market for beautiful scenic and entertaining places for workers and their families to escape to by the train or streetcar on the weekends. In fact, many amusement parks began as picnic rows established by electric streetcar companies, which began to crop up around the region in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Pennsylvania had more trolley companies than any other state in the country, according to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. For example, in 1920 alone, one of the peak years during the trolley era, a state report included 114 electric railway companies. Thanks to Dennis Kramer and Ed Liebarger for those stats. So I imagine Pennsylvania conceivably had a higher number of trolley parks as well. Many of those in Western PA are listed here, including a couple surviving ones. While there are only a handful of amusement parks still operating in Western Pennsylvania today, at one time there were dozens, even those that weren't built by streetcar companies. I'd like to highlight a few of these amusement parks that had interesting carousel histories and mysteries, as they are definitely one of the most fascinating characters in these park stories. Before Cascade Park opened under the operation of the Newcastle Traction Company, People had flocked to this Lawrence County picnic grove since at least 1886. The spot just outside Newcastle along Big Run Creek was originally named Big Run Falls. It became known as Brinton Park after Civil War veteran Colonel Levi Brinton, who purchased the property in 1891 and began developing the picnic grounds as well as his own streetcar company to access the park. Considering Brinton Park, I've noted the park's inception year as 1891, but it was in 1897 when the Newcastle Traction Company acquired the property and unfinished trolley line from Brinton and added new attractions. The park's new name, Cascade, was clearly inspired by the beautiful waterfalls along Big Run. Designed by Boston-based landscape architect Frank Blaisdell, the new Cascade Park featured a large dance hall, boating lake, and many examples of twig architecture that was popular during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Foot bridges and pavilions designed using intertwined branches and logs. A carousel and an Ingersoll figure eight roller coaster, the latter seen here, were some of Cascade Park's earliest rides. In the 1920s, Cascade really started to transition from a simple trolley park into a full-fledged amusement park with help from popcorn and peanut concessionaire, Billy Glenn. Among other attractions, Glenn added a swimming pool and a new roller coaster called the Gorge that was built within the natural ravine created by Big Run. Other classic attractions included a caterpillar, tumblebug, bumper cars, and kiddie land. 
1934, the city of Newcastle acquired ownership of the park, and from the 1950s through the park's closure in the early 1980s, Cascade Park was primarily managed and developed by Paul Vesco, a leading concessionaire whose most notable addition to the park was a second gorge roller coaster, later named the Comet, seen here, which is much missed by roller coaster aficionados. Vesco and the city continually battled over financial debts and park maintenance. The park's condition eventually declined along with its attendance, and it never again operated as an amusement park after the 1982 season. However, a development committee sparked a movement to restore Cascade Park back to a municipal park with a playground, picnic pavilions, flower gardens, and trail that hosts annual community festivals. Last summer, Pleasant Hill Historians of Newcastle was successful in having Cascade Park reaffirmed as eligible for the National Register of Historic Places by the Pennsylvania State Historic Preservation Office. So what happened to its carousels? We know that a new carousel was installed in 1897. It's underneath the pavilion depicted in the souvenir postcard, and it operated there until 1922. That was when a 1911 Denzel Menagerie carousel was moved from Idora Park to Cascade Park and installed in a newly built domed pavilion. Idora received a new Philadelphia Toboggan Company machine. It appears that under this deal, PTC took the 1897 Cascade Park carousel, a two row stationary menagerie carousel, revamped it as number 64R, and installed it at Island Park in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. The Denzel Carousel continued at Cascade Park until it was replaced in the 1950s by an Alan Herschel Carousel, which operated until the park closed. I'd love to know more about these three machines and hopefully find more images of them operating at Cascade Park. So feel free to contact me if you have any leads. Hey, we're heading to the Mon Valley now. Located in Versailles Borough, just a few miles from the city of McKeesport, Olympia Park was established in 1901 by the Pittsburgh, McKeesport, and Connellsville Railway Company on the former Bissell Farm. The picnic destination served as a respite for the local coal mining community. As many as 15,000 suggestions for the new park's name allegedly came in during a contest that the railway company ran. Two people split the prize money as they both suggested the chosen name, inspired by Greek mythology. Olympia means of Mount Olympus, or simply heaven. Later that summer, the first attractions at Olympia Park began to open, including a merry-go-round and a baseball field with grandstand. We see more developments for the 1902 season at Olympia Park including a theater that hosted vaudeville acts and traveling summer stock productions, while live music entertained couples at the park's dance hall. Lake Olympia was created by damming up Long Run, offering a picturesque pond for rowboats with a boathouse. Also had rustic bridges that accessed an island. More examples of that great twig architecture. The most exciting addition that year was the figure eight roller coaster seen here. Over the succeeding years, more rides would be added to the park, including a steam powered miniature railroad, which starred in a 1905 Edison Manufacturing Company silent film spoof called The Little Train Robbery. There was also an Olympic sized swimming pool, pony track, roller skating rink, tumble bug, aerial swings, scooter, caterpillar with shooting gallery and arcade. This 1923 Sanborn fire insurance map gives us a good look at how the attractions and buildings were laid out on the Olympia Park property at the time. The park's original merry-go-round seen on this map was replaced in 1924 by a new carousel, number 69 from the Philadelphia Toboggan Company. Its original figure eight roller coaster was replaced in 1921 by a new coaster called the Leapfrog. With a half mile of dips, it was promoted as the only ride of its kind in Western Pennsylvania, but also a duplicate of roller coasters at other regional parks like Waldemere and Idora. By 1909, Olympia Park came under ownership of West Penn Railways when the company acquired the smaller trolley line. 
1920, longtime concessionaire Henry Hamp leased both Olympia and Oakford Parks, uh, Oakford was located in Jeanette, from West Penn Railways and operated them under the Olympia Oakford Park Company. Olympia Park continued to operate for about another 20 years, but by the onset of World War II and resulting travel restrictions, its days were numbered. The park never reopened after 1942, although the Colonial Inn Hotel, which predated the park, and the roller skating rink did linger on for some years after. In early 1943, after about 40 years of operation, management decided to close Olympia Park for good dismantle the buildings and list its amusements for sale. The property became a dumping ground for waste from the nearby coal mines and eventually Olympia Shopping Center was built on top of the former amusement park site. So what happened to Olympia Park's carousels? When PTC number 69 was installed in 1924, PTC took the original two road track machine and revamped it as number 73R. It operated briefly in Wildwood, New Jersey, and then was moved to Lawnside Amusement Park, located in New Jersey's only African-American incorporated municipality, the borough of Lawnside in Camden County. Number 73R was removed from the park in 1945 and dispersed, whereabouts unknown. PTC number 69 didn't last much longer after its time at Olympia Park. It operated at Palisades Park in New Jersey for about a year before it was moved to Old Orchard Beach in Maine in 1946. Old Orchard Beach suffered a few fires in its history, including one in October 1948, um, in which Billboard magazine reported the merry-go-round was wiped out, presumably PTC number 69, although more document documentation is needed to corroborate that. Benango County entrepreneur John Smithman established what was originally known as Smithman Park in 1896 for the Oil City Street Railway Company, a trolley line he also chartered. The park was located in Cranberry Township between Oil City and Franklin and right in the heart of the commercial oil industry that had developed in northwestern Pennsylvania in the 1850s. Initially, Smithman Park only had an auditorium picnic pavilion and restaurant, but that would change. The competing Citizens Traction Company bought the park in 1901 and connected its streetcar line with those in Franklin. The park's name was changed to Monarch Park as Monarch was the maiden name of the Traction Company owner's wife. The Citizens Traction Company began developing Monarch Park, adding a children's playground, a larger dance hall, a two-story open-air dining pavilion, a miniature railroad, Ferris wheel, whirlpool ride, bowling alley, museum, and a row of game and novelty booths known as the Great White Way. The 120 foot tall electric tower seen here was the most impressive building at the park, illuminated by several thousand lamps powered by the electricity generated from the streetcar line. Designed by John A. Miller and built by the Ingersoll Construction Company of Pittsburgh, the Thriller roller coaster was added to Monarch Park in 1913. Despite such additions, Monarch Park remained a very picturesque recreation spot with natural springs, tree covered picnic areas, an intricate flower garden, and again, that iconic twig architecture, including several rustic footbridges over Two Mile Run. After World War I, Monarch Park saw years of declining attendance, likely due to competition from other regional parks. Citizens Traction Company leased the park to an outside firm and put Monarch Park up for sale in 1926, also discontinuing trolley service between Oil City and Franklin. The park closed for good after the 1926 season and the property was purchased more than a decade later by the Oil City chapter of the Isaac Walton League of America. Now known as Waltonian Park, it's currently owned by the Waltonian Park Association and leased to the Isaac Walton League, a conservation organization that promotes outdoor recreation. Now on to the carousels. Monarch Park had two of them during its lifetime. The first was a Herschel Spillman track machine installed in the pavilion seen on this postcard. 
1915, this machine would be replaced by a Denzel number 106, a three row menagerie machine and a new pavilion built. After Monarch Park closed, the Denzel was sold to Wald Lake Amusement Park in Detroit, Michigan, where it operated until the early 1960s and then moved to Edgewater Park, also in Detroit, for about another dozen years. The Denzel was damaged in a flood at Edgewater Park and sold in 1974 to Larry Friels of California, who would eventually amass a very extensive carousel collection. Some of the restored figures were intermittently featured in public exhibitions over the years, and the Friels collection has since been donated to various museums, including the New England Carousel Museum in Bristol, Connecticut, and the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento, California. Uh, William Passer has a really nice Oil City and Monarch Park website where you can read more about this particular Denzel and its journey after it, it left Monarch Park. Murder, bootlegging, fires and floods are some of the interesting tales you'll find in the history of Four Mile Creek Park, a small and obscure amusement park on the eastern outskirts of Erie, Pennsylvania. It's one of my favorite lost amusement park stories. Its origins begin in 1887 when Jacob Lang and Christian Ray purchased 13 acres of Richard Crawley's land along Lake Erie at the mouth of Four Mile Creek. A large hotel called the Grove House was built on the bluffs overlooking the lake, and soon folks would arrive by steamer and follow the steps up the hill to the Grand Hotel. Guests also arrived by streetcar. Although it wasn't established by the traction company that owned and operated Waldemere Park on the western side of the city, the line was extended out to Grove House Park. Allegedly, Waldemere was a dry park, while its eastern competitor permitted alcohol. The stately Grove House was sadly destroyed by fire in September 1902. In turn, Alfred Lang began developing what was renamed Four Mile Creek Park into a more traditional amusement park. We see the additions of a roller skating rink, a dance hall seen here, and bowling, plus a restaurant. An outdoor summer theater was also built, and that hosted vaudeville acts and musical comedies, plus it showed motion pictures. By 1914, Herbert T. Foster would be managing Four Mile Creek Park. That same year, a new gigantic figure eight roller coaster was built and it opened in time for the 4th of July. On August 3rd, 1915, the park was ravaged by a storm that flooded waterways across Erie County, Four Mile Creek included. Flooding caused millions of dollars worth of damage, killed at least 35 people and left many more homeless. Many of the park's attractions, including the roller coaster, were damaged, but the theater and other concessions gradually reopened and the park was rehabilitated for the next season. Miraculously, it seems the park's new carousel added that season survived the flooding without damage, at least nothing significant enough to report. Earlier that year, the Erie Times News announced the addition of a new $12,000 merry-go-round and $4,000 band organ at Four Mile Creek Park. This was a three-row carousel that had entertained pleasure goers since 1909, when it first operated in Louisville, Kentucky. Philadelphia Toboggan Company Carousel Number 18 was placed at Four Mile Creek Park in 1915. Four Mile Creek Park continued as an amusement destination for about another decade. The park's history is also intertwined with that of the General Electric Company. The park was located in what's now known as the Township of Lawrence Park, a company town established by GE, which began building a manufacturing facility for Erie in 1910. The park site was eventually purchased and redeveloped into a golf course for GE employees, today known as the Lawrence Park Golf Club but for a time, the two seem to coexist. It's possible the expansion of Lawrence Park and the golf course plus prohibition may have impacted the eventual closure of Four Mile Creek Park. The beer that was served at the park's refreshment parlors now caught the attention of police. So did rum runners crossing Lake Erie and docking at the park. While the park's new lessees uh, announced grand plans to refresh Four Mile Creek Park for the 1925 season, an early May fire destroyed the bar and office, bowling alley, and theater buildings and spelled the end of the park. PTC number 18, revamped as number 78R, 
would be moved to Long Branch Amusement Park in Syracuse, New York for the 1926 season, and then to Roseland Amusement Park in Canandaigua, New York, before it was sold at auction in 1985 after that park closed. The machine was restored and installed at the original Carousel Center Mall in Syracuse. More than 30 years later, you can still ride it at today's Destiny USA. Many other lost Western Pennsylvania amusement parks also featured carousels, including Alameda Park, which was opened by the Butler Passenger Railway Company in 1901, about two miles or so west of Butler. Here we see the park's E. Joy Morris Menagerie Carousel, which was later replaced by a new carousel and building. We don't quite know what happened to either carousel, although allegedly horses from the second one are on display at the South Coast Plaza Mall in Costa Mesa, California. In 1901, the Beaver Valley Traction Company purchased and developed two parks on both ends of its streetcar line in Beaver County, Junction Park in Rochester Township and Murado Park in Beaver Falls. Each would have its own carousel. Here's Junction Park, which was located in a more industrialized and flood prone area along the Beaver River. And here's the more rustic Murado Park located in Beaver Falls at the northern end of the trolley line near the Wallace Run Ravine. Both trolley parks would close after the Beaver Valley Traction Company discontinued service in 1937, but unfortunately it's unknown what happened to both carousels. Aliquippa Grove or Aliquippa Park was one of the earliest picnic and amusement sites in Western Pennsylvania. This was a railroad park established by the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad, which opened in 1880. It closed in, it closed in 1906, and it would be inquired by the Jones and Laughlin Steel Company for a new steel mill. Here's a lovely view of what's likely an Armitage Herschel track machine with a steam engine that appears to the right. In Fayette County, Shady Grove Park in Lamont Furnace, outside of Uniontown, also had what looks like a menagerie carousel. You could also ride a carousel at Cool Coney on the Ohio. Thanks to Fred Dollinger, here's a really neat postcard view of the machine at Coney Island, a very short-lived amusement park on Pittsburgh's Neville Island, surrounded by the Ohio River and accessed by boat, train, or trolley. The park seemed to have had financial difficulties from the very start, and it only lasted a few seasons. Finally, as an interesting carousel tangent, the city of Pittsburgh purchased three stationary menagerie carousels from the Philadelphia Toboggan Company, numbers 23, 24, and 25, and installed them at three municipal parks in 1913. Uh, they were Shenley Park in Oakland, seen here, Riverside Park on the north side, and Grandview Park at Mount Washington on the south side. The parks I mentioned are only a few of the many amusement parks in western Pennsylvania that once thrived and then disappeared for a variety of or combination of reasons. The demise of streetcar service that brought customers coupled with the rise of the automobile, competition with other regional parks, financial woes, the Great Depression, fire and flood disasters, and decisions from owners not to continue in the industry. I'd like to thank the many historical societies, libraries, museums, amusement park organizations, historians and experts who have generously shared images and helped me research these amusement parks for an upcoming book and related presentations like today's carousel chat. Without them, I couldn't do such a project and I really appreciate it. I'm happy to take any questions um, or if you think of something after today's program, if you have any additional information about the carousels I've mentioned, or if you know of any great research leads you'd like to share, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. So much, Jen, for that wonderful presentation. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Rose um, for your presentation. Hey, thanks, Marissa. Can everybody hear me okay, I hope? Okay, um, Logan's gonna help with the video section. Um, so uh, you'll hear me say next a few times. Well, let's get started. Um, Western New York had approximately 100 amusement parks between 1853 and the present. 
Only four are still in operation, but tonight we're gonna to learn about some of the area's popular and unique lost parks. Next. Christmas Park was Western New York's first theme park. Charles W. Howard loved to play Santa and his services were highly requested throughout the area. He opened Christmas Park on his Albion farm in 1953. Next, Howard converted his barn into Christmas Wonderland with displays of Christmas celebrations from around the world, animated reindeer and toy making elves. The barn also housed a Santa Claus school where Howard taught men how to be an exceptional Santa. Next. There were only two mechanical rides in the park. A miniature train circled the property, passing a life-size nativity display and going through an igloo tunnel that had cold air blasting through it. The other ride was a converted Alan Herschel helicopter. It went a Christmas tree with rotating ornaments. Howard died of a heart attack in 1966 and his heirs closed the park permanently in 1968. The Santa Claus School is still in operation, although it's now in Michigan. Next. Frontier Village was a Wild West theme park that opened in 1966 on South Mountain above Salamanca. It was the only park in Western New York to have an incline railroad that took visitors up the mountain from the parking lot and back. Next. Park attractions included an authentic stagecoach ride, a train ride through the woods, shootouts, and can can dancers. Celebrities such as Hank Williams Jr. and Lassie often appeared at the park. Next, Fentier Village drew over 1,000 visitors a day, but the park only lasted for four years. New York State forced the park to close in 1969 to make way for the Southern Tier Expressway. Next, Celeron Park was located on the shore of Chautauqua Lake near the city of Jamestown. It opened in 1894 with a large indoor theater, an outdoor bandstand, and an enclosed dance hall. The Phoenix Wheel, shown here, opened in 1896. It was 115 feet tall, the tallest wheel in North America at that time. 350 lights illuminated its structure at night. Next. Comedian and actress Lucille Ball grew up only a few blocks from Celeron Park. As a child, she saw many performances at the theater and she worked at the park during her teen years. In 1948, Harry Illions, son of Carousel Carver Marcus Illions, purchased Celeron. He made improvements and even added one of his father's supreme carousels. Harry was accused of neglecting the park after moving the carousel and the Phoenix Wheel to California where he was in charge of a fairgrounds midway project. Patronage declined and he put the park up for sale. Harry Illions died suddenly in 1962 and his heir sold the property to the town of Celeron and dismantled the park. Next. Next. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Western New York had dozens of kiddie parks during the 1950s and 1960s, but the most popular of these was Glen Park off Main Street in Williamsville. Next. Owned by entrepreneur Harry Altman, Glen Park had games, live pony rides, novelty stands, refreshment stands, a zoo, a playground, and kiddie rides. Next, Altman also ran a nightclub in the park. Originally called the Casino, it was turned into a teen club in the 60s called the Inferno. In 1968, the Inferno caught fire. Although the kitty area was not damaged from the fire, it did not open the following summer. Most of the rides were sold to Fun and Games Park on Young Street in Tonawanda. Today, Glen Park is a walking park owned by the towns of Amherst and Williamsville. Next. Fun and Games Park actually began as a sporting park with batting cages, a golf driving range, and miniature golf. It sat on land leased from Twin Fair, which had a store in the rear of the property. The I-290 drive-in was across the way, which is now occupied by Tops and other retailers. Next. Purchasing the rides from Glen Park proved to be a genius move as attendance suddenly increased. Fun and Games expanded over the next few years adding a picnic shelter seating 1,500, and major rides such as the Wild Mouse, a Ferris wheel, and the Tempest. The park's life ended abruptly in 1981 when Twin Fair refused to renew its lease in order to expand its retail space. Next. 
Following the closing of the Pan Am Exposition in Buffalo in 1901, two noteworthy parks opened within the city limits, less than one mile apart. Inspired by the offerings of the closed expo, Fairyland on Ferry and Jefferson Streets attempted to create an experience for patrons that went beyond the rides. While 30 rides, including a Ferris wheel and carousel were the main attractions, Fairyland had a stadium and theater where vaudeville dancing, Wild West shows, circuses, and other fantastic entertainment took place. General admission to the park was charged, but the shows required a separate ticket. Fairyland never turned a profit as it had direct competition from nearby athletic park and indirect competition from lakeside parks such as Crystal Beach, Erie Beach, and Woodlawn Beach. It closed permanently in 1909. The area is now a residential neighborhood. Next. Athletic Park opened on a triangular parcel of land between Main Street, East Sullivan, and Jefferson in 1902. Several attractions from the Pan Am Expo were moved to the park, including the scenic railway coaster and the Temple of Mirth Funhouse. The Midway also had a figure eight roller coaster, a shoot the shoots foam ride, an electric carousel, two Ferris wheels, and a German restaurant serving roast beef sandwiches. Next. Despite its offerings, Athletic Park was unable to turn a profit. The Midway was busy only on Sundays when competing amusement parks like Crystal Beach were closed. Its financial problems forced owners to sell the park in 1907 when it became Luna Park. Next. Luna Park opened with a new attraction and a grand entrance erected on Jefferson. A casino used for roller skating and dancing was built alongside the Skajakata Creek, which ran through the south end of the property before being rerouted underground. The following season, the park expanded with new attractions. The auto dip took up half of the park's 10 acres. It was a type of roller coaster with touring auto cars that ran over a course featuring deep dips and three 80-foot tunnels. A razzle-dazzle from the Herschel Spillman Company, a bump-the-bump -bump slide, and a house upside down funhouse were also new that season. A fire broke out on the Midway in July of 1909, destroying a majority of the park. Next. The property was sold to a new owner. C.A. Johnson promised to open a new park called Car Carnival Court the following summer. The manager was Arthur C. Williams, who had previously managed Crystal Beach. Carnival Court opened with a $75,000 scenic railway, a custom-built carousel, an old mill, and a witching waves, an earlier bumper car type of ride that moved on an undulated track. Next. Carnival Court wasn't very profitable. It was sold in 1913. The new owner added a few new rides and offered five cents admission for women and children in the afternoons, but these additions didn't attract attendance as had hoped. The park couldn't expand and it couldn't keep up with the lakeside parks. Carnival Court operated sporadically for the next seven years until it was finally put out of its misery and closed permanently in 1920. A Sears and Roebuck store was built on the site. That building and most of Carnival Court property now belongs to Canisius College. Next. So now we're gonna talk about Crystal Beach. It was located on Ontario's Lake Erie shore, but it, it was the most popular and beloved park for generations of Western New Yorkers. Though for anybody that doesn't know, it was actually in Canada. So next. Crystal Beach Park began as a religious campground in 1888. By 1890, it had transformed into a summer resort with entertainment, beach access, lake swimming, hotels, and beachfront cottages. It also had an open-air dance hall and rides operated by both man and mule. Next. Several different ships ferried passengers back and forth between Buffalo and Crystal Beach until 1908 when the Americana made her maiden run. The Canadiana joined her in 1910. They were the first steamships built for leisure travel on Lake Erie. The sister ships were full, often crowded, on every run, but ridership began to decrease in the 1920s. Cars became more affordable for the average worker, and the completion of the Peace Bridge connecting Western New York to Ontario in 1927 made getting to the park quicker than going by boat. Two boats were no longer needed, so the Americana was retired from service after the 1929 season and sold to ride Playland on Long Island, New York. From there, it went to a concern in Baltimore, Maryland, where it was eventually scrapped. 
The Canadiana continued service to Crystal Beach until 1956, when a summer of gang riots on board caused her owners to retire her. The Canadiana's fate after Crystal Beach is a long and sad story, ending with her being cut up for scrap in 2004. Next. The ballroom opened in 1925 as cantilevered construction created the largest unobstructed dance floor in North America. Dances were 10 cents for one or 25 cents for three. Famous swing bands from both sides of the border played there. The ballroom was the center of the park as it also housed park offices on the second floor and in the basement, restrooms, a coat check, bowling alley, and an archery range. In the 1960s, two walkthrough attractions were put in the basement. One was Movie Land Monster Wax Museum and the other Fantasyland, a children's fairy tale themed walkthrough. A fire in 1974 nearly gutted the building's interior. It was rebuilt. New restrooms and a restaurant took up the front half of the building and a pirate themed dark ride took up the rear. In 1984, the rear portion once again became a ballroom. Next. When park owner George C. Hall decided to build a modern roller coaster, he approached designer Harry Traver and asked for a wicked roller coaster. The cyclone was the result. It was a mass of twisted track that left riders disorientated, terrorized, and sometimes injured. A nurse was hired to stay in the station while it was operating. The cyclone's bad reputation soon had more people watching it than riding it. The cyclone ended its 20 year reign of terror in 1946 when it was finally dismantled. Next. The giant coaster, also known as the yellow coaster, debuted in 1916. Touted as a fast and smooth ride, the side friction coaster was rattling at times, but its large sofa-like seats made up for it. When Crystal Beach closed, the Giant was the oldest ride in the park and one of the last side friction coasters in North America. Next. Crystal Beach Park's waterfront changed dramatically with the addition of the Comet roller coaster in 1948. Most of its steel structure came from the cyclone. It was an exhilarating ride alongside Lake Erie with a steep first drop, 14 hills, tight turns, and a double downhill. It could reach speeds of 55 miles per hour. The Comet was sold at auction in 1989 to Charlie Wood, a Western New York native who owned the Great Escape in Lake George, New York. It continues to operate there, introducing new generations of riders to its unbridled speed and major airtime. Next. The Laugh in the Dark was the only new ride built at Crystal Beach during the Great Depression of the 1930s. The ride was placed inside the former bowling alley and given an oriental theme. The dark ride had scenes with moving characters and stunts that included bright flashing lights and loud horns. Part of its outside ballyhoo was Laughing Sal, a mechanical woman whose laugh soundtrack ran on a loop. Next. The magic carpet was a castle-like structure at the park's front entrance. Patrons walked through rooms with a maze, slanted floors, spinning discs and along outside corridors where air blew into their faces. At the end was the carpet ride. In the 1970s, the carpet was bypassed to the exit because of vandalism and rising insurance costs. The attraction was renamed the Magic Palace. Next. The carousel was the heart of the park. Philadelphia to Bond Company number 12 Menagerie Carousel arrived at Crystal Beach in 1910. It was populated with horses, dogs, goats, leopards, zebras, donkeys, deer, a seahorse, a lion, a tiger, and a rare wolf. Next. In 1984, the carousel was sold piecemeal at an auction held in Indiana. It was never offered as an entire unit. The money from the sale was to go to improvements for the park. It was replaced by a 1940s Alan Herschel aluminum carousel. Next. Crystal Beach Park was known for its special treats. Favorites included saltwater taffy called Kisses and Hull Suckers that came in five flavors, peanut, coconut, lemon, butterscotch, and cinnamon. Fresh hot sugar waffles sprinkled with powdered sugar made fun treats to eat at the park or to take home at the end of the day. Next. Cars have always been used to create amusement park rides since they became popular with the public. Crystal Beach had several rides of car themes over the years. The bumper cars, antique cars, turnpike, and the auto speedway shown. Oh, go to one. We missed one. We missed one. Oh, no. Oh, that's okay. Never mind. <laughs> the turnpike and the auto speedway that ran along a wooden track with small hills along the course. 
All right. We're going to keep the pony carts up for a minute. Many people ask, why did Crystal Beach Park close? Some answer it was the competition, but the opening of Darien Lake in Western New York and Canada's Wonderland near Toronto, both in 1981, were only a small part that led to the closing. Crystal Beach's problems began in the mid 1970s and it was a slow downhill slide from there. Next. The park's ownership changed hands and in 1976, a pay one price admission was charged, ending 88 years of free admission and the ticket system. Many patrons disliked the new policy, although ironically, it was accepted five years later when the new parks opened. On top of the admission charge, there was an additional charge for premium rides like the Comet. This charge was later eliminated. Admission was changed to patrons' choice of pay one price or a walk around admission for non riders, but it made little impact on the profit. Next. Most of the park's flat rides and some permanent installations were owned by outside parties. When Crystal Beach owners offered to purchase the rides, some concessionaires refused to sell. The owners of the park continued to lease a few rides while buying others, causing a strain on park finances. Several rides were removed and it became rare for a new ride to be brought in, leaving the midway with less attractions than in the past. Next. Next. The installation of the Sawmill River Flume in 1981 was the last permanent ride. It was a great addition to the park, but it was expensive. Building it required the rerouting of the train tracks, moving miniature golf in the picnic grove, and removing the auto speedway, which was the previous photo. There were also mechanical problems almost from the beginning. So in reality, the ride cost more than expected and the money was never fully recouped. Next. The 1980s was a turbulent decade for the park. Older rides broke down, the cost to repair them was prohibitive, so they were removed from the midway. They were replaced with game boots and flower beds instead of new rides. Park ownership changed hands several times and each owner had a different vision for the park. In 1983, the park went into receivership for unpaid taxes. There was a brief resurgence when the front half of the Comet's trains were turned backwards, but that didn't last. The dwindling midway and the change of color from bright orange, blue, and yellow to drab earth tones was part of the reason patrons from Western New York decided not to cross the border. On the US side, company and school picnics went to Darien Lake or Fantasy Island. On the Canadian side, they went to Marineland or Canada's Wonderland. The loss of the picnics was the final blow. The land was worth much more than the entire park. A decision was made to permanently close Crystal Beach Park. Its final day of operation was Labor Day of 1989. Uh, if anybody um, wants to learn more about Crystal Beach, um, I do have a book called Crystal Memories, and you can um, go to my Facebook page, Rose Hirsch, and send me a message if you're interested. Or you can go to um, any of the bookstores or Amazon and get my book, Western New York Amusement Parks, to learn more about the parks in the Western New York area. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rose, so much for your presentation. It is now time for our Q&A, and I see we already have some in the uh, chat. All right, this one is for Rose. In the Spilden Herschel's ownership, what machines were produced more, wood carved or aluminum ones? Uh, for Herschel Spillman, it was wood. But the Allen Herschel Company did wood in the early years, and then in the 1920s, they did what was called a half and half where they put metal extremities onto a wood body. And then from that point on, they decided the aluminum was working well enough that they wanted to just continue with a full aluminum horse. And so from about the late 1920s through um, to the time that the company was sold 1970, they were making aluminum carousels. Thank you for that. Okay. And then Um, was the wild, and sorry, this is another one for Rose. Was the wild mouse at Crystal Beach a steel or wooden coaster? It was a wooden coaster. It was made by a German manufacturer. Um, and it was had, it was rare because there were few in North America that were made out of wood. And it actually lasted until um, 1980 
when it was taken down, but it was considered by a lot of people almost as terrifying as the cyclone. Thank you. And now for the both of you, um, at what point does an amusement park become a lost park? Is there a certain number of years or anything that you'd say or a certain, um, anything that has to happen for it to officially become a lost park? Well, see, that's a, that's a gray area because um, parks can become a lost park because of lack of patronage, um, too much competition, maybe the the rides are not being replaced by new rides, lack of interest, uh, people's interests change. Maybe that the local parks particularly suffer because people want to take their vacation elsewhere. They leave the area. So it just depends on the circumstances. And Jen, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it's definitely a great area. I mean, you have parks like, you know, Rainbow Gardens in White, where I grew up there's absolutely nothing left. It's a shopping center. Um, but then like Cascade Park, the one, one of the parks I mentioned tonight, it's still, um, it's not an amusement park, but it's still a park um, very much in the same vein as when it first started as picnic grounds. Same with Alameda Park in Butler. It's now owned by the county and it's got, you know, picnic pavilions and, um, and, and still trees and walking trails. So it's not an amusement park, but it's still somewhat of a recreational park. So yeah, it's def definitely a gray area. Um, I think just for it not to be an amusement park, you obviously have to remove all of the rides. Um, then that also brings in the question, when does a park become an amusement park in the first place? There's that gray area and the transition from scenic picnic grove to the amusement park and how many rides do you have to have? So I guess it's all in your interpretation and what criteria you use to determine that. All right, thank you. That was a very interesting question. All right, now we have a question that, do you recommend any parks where there are enough remnants to make a visit worthwhile? Cascade and Alameda near Butler are worth a stop. So do you have yeah, for, uh, Four Mile Creek, um, it's worth it just to see how beautiful the golf course is. Um, it's still very wooded and just looking out on Lake Erie, I have to imagine, even though there's no rides there, you're still seeing that same view that picnickers saw there back in, you know, 1915. So that, um, yeah, it's a private golf club, but the public can still go there and um, there's a public right away that you could walk along, right along um, uh, the edge of the lake. So I definitely recommend checking out Four Mile Creek. And well, in Western New York, um, most of the parks have either been turned into condos or shopping centers. Um, so there's not a lot of remnants left. Uh, but if you go down to Williamsville to Glen Park, it's been turned into a beautiful walking park and you can feed the ducks or take pictures. A lot of people take pictures by the waterfall. Uh, one of the lost parks that I didn't mention is up in Alcott. It was called Alcott Beach Park and is actually reborn into Alcott Carousel Beach Park where the rides are five cents. And it's mostly a kiddie park, but the original roundhouse is still there. So it's worth going over to that park to just visit and see what the site as it used to be and is now. We do have a comment that um, Ed responded, Rose, uh, Orchard Beach too. Are you familiar with Orchard Beach? Um, that, that's, um, I don't remember Orchard Beach or didn't find anything on Orchard Beach in Western New York. Um, I know there was an Orchard Beach in, um, you know, the, uh, New England area, but um, I'm not familiar with Orchard Beach in Western New York. Yeah, there was one um, in Northeast, you know, just not too far from the New York border. Maybe that's the Orchard Beach. It's possible, yeah. yeah. Similar to Four Mile Creek Park, just right um, on Lake. And and Jen, are there any side friction coasters still in operation? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, 
I have friends who are much more well-versed in coaster mechanics than I am. So I'm not sure. I, I would I have can to actually, do research. <laughs> I can actually answer that because I've ridden it. The Leap the Dips at Lakemont Park um, in Altoona, Pennsylvania, I believe is the last site friction coaster in the North America. Okay. And they're using the original trains. The whole thing's been rebuilt and restored. It, it's a great ride. Yeah, I have not been there yet. And I feel terrible because I don't live that far away. <laughs> so I'm going to make it a goal this year to finally get there. I've been to Del Grosso's, which is not too oh, far. Oh, yeah, away. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, actually, the Skyliner that is at um, Lakemont came from one of the parks that we used to go to, Roseland Park. Uh, you had mentioned about their carousel and they had actually moved the Skyliner down there. So, you know, it's worth the trip for anybody who went to Roseland Park to go down there and ride both coasters, actually. And let's see, question two. Uh, Rose, was the Crystal Beach carousel shown in the presentation a Herschel carousel? Um, well, okay. The, the one shown in the presentation was not. It's Philadelphia to Bond Company number 12. And it actually had been um, on a different, the animals had been on a different platform when it operated at um, Chestnut Hill in Pennsylvania. And I, working with PTC, we decided that um, the reason there was a change in the machine was because the um, owners of PTC were using Chestnut Hill as a showcase for their animals. So they took the animals off and put them on a different machine. And so when it came to Crystal Beach, it was not as pretty a machine and the horses were, animals were really tight to each other, but um, it was all wood. And uh, it was just, it, it wasn't considered a revision. It was just number 12. And it had the only wolf that anybody ever made on a carousel up until that time. Okay. And then Jen, a question for you. Have you done research on New York carousels? I've been trying to track down exactly where our carousel came from in Eldridge Park in Elmira, New York. It's an 1890s Louf carousel installed in 1925 by Bob Long. Ooh. Um, I have not specifically, but I'm definitely opening up my research scope because you know, the PTC number 18 is a prime example of connections between uh, rides that operated in Pennsylvania, but they moved to other states. Um, and, you know, for that carousel, you have Kentucky, you have potentially Massachusetts, you have Pennsylvania, and then you have New York. Um, and when Rose mentioned Celeron Park, um, there's some connections there as well. I believe the owner of Cabana Beach, um, it's, it was in Washington County, PA, uh, Cecil Township area outside of Hendersonville. I remember reading something about the owner buying some attractions from Celeron Park. So I definitely, once I get my PA parks book done, I would love to do some more research um, in, into New York rides and carousels, Ohio. So I'm definitely... Uh, Definitely open to that. And if I can help you in any way, let me know, Beth. Well, Eldridge Park Carousel, sorry to jump in there, but Eldridge Park Carousel was sold in auction. They do have a carousel operating now. And from what my understanding is, and I, I, I'm not really sure about it, but I understand there's a couple horses from the original carousel on there, but um, the carousel that they have now in there is um, wood, uh, but the original carousel was sold in pieces. All right, so I think this might be our last question of the day. And this one is for the both of you. Do you feel that trolley park type parks could make a comeback in the future in some form? Well, I, we don't use trolleys anymore, but um, there are still good examples of trolley parks out there that have been continued to be successful, such as Kennywood, you know, Pittsburgh area and Lake Compounds uh, in Connecticut. So um, these are still family owned parks or, or corporation parks that 
are not um, interested in expanding um, like in Six Flags or something like that. There still is room for that traditional style park and they are very successful at it. So um, I, I think that as long as people um, patronize their local parks, they'll still be around. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, Rose. And I, um, I'd also like to give a, a plug for my pals at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum in Washington, PA. If you're, in, if you're ever in this area and you want to ride on a trolley and get that experience of, you know, what it was like to travel on the streetcar to the park, definitely um, visit there because um, they have a bunch of operating trolleys throughout the season. And I think it would be really awesome for them to um, maybe acquire a carousel at some point. Um, so I've, one of my friends there and I have kind of talked about that pipe dream. So um, maybe we'll see that happen. That'd be awesome. Perfect. All right. And uh, Beth Clark just wanted to make a follow up to the uh, Eldred Park. Um, she says that the carousel Eldred Park is the only or, sorry, is the original mechanism. Only the animals were sold off in 1989. So thank you for that clarification, Beth. And that was the last question that I've gotten in. So thank you so much for your time, Jen and Rose. Um, it was a delight having you. And thank you to all of our viewers. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you.